All right, hello. Uh, this is going to be the first lecture over the first PowerPoints. Uh, the goal of this is not to go over every single word on the slides. Uh, I don't want to. I want to try to keep these videos, these lectures, as short as possible, but still cover most of the material. Uh, I, I, I'm going on the assumption that you can read what I have on the slides already, so I may not spend a whole lot of time directly reading the slides, but I also have a lot of pictures that without some interpretation you may be, why is there a random picture of a buffalo shaman having sex with an earth goddess? That's weird. And maybe it is. Um, but maybe there's a point to me having it in there as well. So the goal here again with these, and with all of these uh, lectures, is to give you some more context to hopefully help hopefully help you understand it. I may even occasionally remember what's on a quiz, so by listening to these you may occasionally get quiz answers. Don't hold me to that though because I have a bad short-term memory. Uh, but hopefully this will prove helpful, especially for when you're writing your essays, you'll have at least some context to go on. Okay, rambled enough. Um, this section should roughly correspond if you've bought the Duker and Spillvogel book to chapter one, section one. That's not a lot, but I go into a little more detail uh, in areas that uh, I enjoy more. So um, these things won't necessarily correspond exactly all the time to certain chapters in the book, but you should be able to find similar information there that could supplement uh, what you're going to get from these lectures. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to send me an email, uh, and I will get back to you as quickly as I can. All right, so the first thing that I like to sort of think about when I think about the ancient world uh, and so what we're talking about here, we're gonna, what we're starting with is the first, uh, the first sort of shift from hunter-gatherers. I mean, we could go all the way back to Australopithecines millions of years ago, but um, you could always take my wife's, uh, one of my wife's anthropology classes for that. Um, we're just going to sort of start with when people start settling down. How do we transition? And it's mostly what this slide section is going to be about. Uh, some worldview building. So in other words, how do these people see the world around them? And then what this transition looked like? What were the big changes that happened? So I think one of the hardest things to understand sometimes about ancient people, because I mean, sometimes we get this idea, God, they were a bunch of dummies walking around beating each other over the head with sticks and making fires and going, ugga, ugga, chugga, something like that. I mean, I get this... Uh, I get this idea of, I probably should put this in my PowerPoints, but we're just going to do, here we go, year one, here we go, this is it, right? Um, <laughs> we, oh, and, oh, this is actually kind of a funny movie, but, uh, you know, we cave man, we kill, oh, okay. well, I mean, it makes us feel kind of good to see these people like this, but really, when we're talking about, I don't know, only, uh, Come on, there we go. Only 12,000 years ago, uh, these people aren't that different from us. People do different things. C circumstances changes. Circumstances change. But human nature being what it is, things don't change much. Uh, so and some, some of this may seem very similar, but sort of what I want to get at here is the sort of intellectual apparatuses that these people have. In other words, their worldviews were quite a bit different because we have things like, oh, and I've got my pen to use, we have things like, ooh, this is going to be fun, uh, the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution. So in other words, we understand that there is a heliocentric solar system. We understand the planets have a roughly elliptical orbits. We understand we're in a galaxy. Okay, well, maybe, we could, maybe you're a flat Earth person or something like that. More power to you, but we're going with... Consensus here, uh, if you want to shoot me argumentative emails about, about flat earth and it makes you feel better, go for it. But these people don't have any of that. Like, uh, you know, before 1700, a lot of this looked a lot different. I mean, these people have no concept of geological time. They have no concept of the cosmos as we see it. So, and, and they have no, so if, and for example, like, so physics, Aristotelian physics. Now, what we're talking about here is before Aristotle by a good bit, but this gives you an example of how different things were. Um, maybe we'll go to a pretty picture. Oh, there we go. Um, there's a pretty picture. Um, but I, I, what I want to sort of say with this is, right, um, think about water and air bubbles inside water. What makes air rise? 
what makes water fall down to get to other water. Like the Aristotelian physics would say like seeks out like. So in other words, rocks fall when we throw them up in the air, not because of this abstract idea of gravity, but because it's a rock and it likes to be near other rocks and it's drawn to them almost like a magnet. It's why air rises in water. It's why water goes downhill. It's a very different view of physics. And, and to be fair, Aristotle is a very intelligent person, although his views are, of course, dated now and incorrect. But I mean, what does the average person think? I mean, is it any, any better, any different from that? Maybe not even that sophisticated. So yeah, if you don't have telescopes, you don't have satellites, I mean, we grow up looking at pictures of the Earth, we grow up, grow up looking at projections of the, uh, you know, seeing the Earth from the moon, and, oh lord, let's not get into moon landing fake stuff, please, let's, let's not go there, but, um, again, if you want to send me crazy emails, um, go for it, um, but these people don't have that perception of the unit, like, we're, that's built into us from when we're little, these people don't have that, they have the horizon, right and so when they look up they there's a dome so there's this idea that the sky is solid in the ancient world the stars are fixed in there it's a crystalline our aristotle calls this the fifth fifth element the quintessence um, the stars are points fixed in the dome planets comes from the greek word for wanderers the reason they're called planets is or wanderers is because they move funny right so when you look up in the night sky today uh and, you, and you've probably seen some of these time lapse pictures in fact i'll try to show you one here um, let's see uh, by Michael Sarah and Jack Black yeah if we fix a telescope sort of at the center at the pole star Polaris it's not quite in the middle but you can see everything kind of moves uh, sort of moves around that like the planets will sometimes move backwards and that's kind of freaky, again, if you see the night sky as kind of a, a fixed dome above and beyond which who knows what's out there, the gods or the gods making these things move in funny ways, especially when you see patterns in the night sky, when you know that there are solar cycles. And th again, think about it. these people, it maybe go without saying, but they don't, they don't have this, always have the same sorts of entertainment we do. They definitely don't have the light pollution. What are you going to do after dark? Well, go up and uh, follow the stars toward, uh, actually, I, I think that's probably the right way, toward Polaris, toward, uh, toward the Pole Star. And yeah, that's actually right, because there's the Little Dipper, and it's the Tail Star in the, in the Little Dipper. So, so it's, it's a very, very different sort of a world. And how's this dome? If it's a big old dome, how's it, uh, how's it held up? Well, is there a lot of uh, these societies? Let me find my, find my marker again. A lot of these societies sort of envision the Earth as being divided into quadrants, right? You see this in Native American uh, lore. You see this uh, even even in uh, even in uh, the New Testament. Revelation talks about angels being on the corners, right? Um, there's this idea, and getting away from sort of the biblical lore, though, like in uh, let's use maybe in this case Norse mythology, it grazes all the world tree. A big old tree that grows up. This is going to be real fun with a mouse pad trying to draw a goofy tree, but eh, sort of. It's got roots that go down, big serpents that live underground. And, and thinking about underground, something else to consider. What causes earthquakes? I mean, not plate tectonics. What the heck is plate tectonics? It's probably big critters flopping around underground. Um, so it's it, again, it's a very different world. And how do you explain all this? How do you figure this stuff out? How do you try to control it? And this is where we're going to see some of these early religions start to develop. You know, these polytheistic religions, different gods or different elements, and those kinds of things. Um, and also time. I, I mentioned I throw time in here because I, I, I'll have a slide on sort of the age of the earth and those kinds of things in just a minute. Um, but people really just don't have any concept of what we think of as geologic time, billions and billions of years. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, if you think about it, too, if you're a, an average person, how, how often do you encounter a million of anything? Well, maybe if you're rich, you encounter a million dollars, but do you ever sit down and count that high? I mean, how long would that even take? It takes a long time. We're good at dealing with thousands and hundreds and even tens and things like that. Um, so time is also another question. And all, you see different societies measure time differently. I mean, a lot of medieval societies and ancient societies have more to do with sun angle, where the sun is on a given day, 
where the sun might be in the sky, where the moon is, um, how rivers are flooding in the case of the Nile. Those things are more meaningful because they dictate the agricultural seasons. And all, all these early civilizations are going to be built around uh, using agriculture. Uh, at least most of them. The Mongols are sort of an exception, but that's much later and they, they conquer things. But most of these early successful societies take advantage of the sort of in some ways relative ease granted by domesticating crops. And to domesticate crops, you got to understand how they grow. You got to know the growing seasons. You got to know when the rain's going to come, when the rain's not going to come. Um, so it's sort of a weird transition we see. We we sort of go from a society that sort of built, and we, there's just so little that we know about. It's sort of you know when we we're trying to trying to figure out you know fixed stars, domes, you know underworld, literally the underworld, and things like that. All the pillars of the earth and the pillars of heaven. Um, you know, when we're looking at sort of something like this, um, this is probably something that's constructed back when we're hunter-gatherers. There are no written documents. Um, so we're reconstructing this based on what we have seen, what anthropologists have seen by not only studying ancient texts, but also studying modern people. There are still, there are still people living in the Amazon that... Uh, have had very little contact with the outside world. In the 19th century, when anthropology was starting to develop, there were people who had had no contact with a modern sort of a world. Um, so, these things have sort of been pieced together, but it must, in some ways, this, this must have seemed much different. Um, and and, and in, in a way, that's kind of my point. I'm not trying to sort of give you a, a a, t a, a broad sort of this is how everything was, and if you don't know it, you're, you know, that's not what I'm going for here. What I'm going for is sort of trying to understand how these people operated to sort of expand your mind, so to speak, uh, to look at, to, to sort of allow for different understandings of the world. Um, because it's going to make understanding why these people do what they do, it's going to make it a little bit easier. And maybe, you know, and even in the modern world, if you can do that, maybe that'll make dealing with people uh, who don't always think the way you do a little more happy. A little happier. Okay, Old Age of the Earth 2, again, I throw this in there because there are some people sometimes that refuse to do some of these assignments because they're like, no, the world is, come on, mouse, this age, and if you want to think that, that's cool with me. I'm not going to give you a test question that says, you have to say the world's 4.5 billion years old. I mean, that's an approximate measure. These things are determined by uh, different types of dating, geologic time, you know, you, look, you're right, I wasn't there. I, I've only been here since June in 1983, uh, relatively very little, not even a drop of the bucket, maybe a molecule of a drop in the bucket of geologic time. But the same principles of physics and chemistry that dictate how we do everything else in the modern world also help us to date the world as being at the very least, older than 6,020 years old. Why this number? Some people might be like, why in the world? What's such a random number? Well, there was a guy named Bishop Usher in uh, the 16th century in England who decided he was going to go back through the Bible to all the genealogies, and he was going to date the world. It was like, the I don't know, let's, let's look it up. Let's, I, I can't remember what Usher's chronology He had a very specific day, and it's the only reason I'm looking. Anyway, October 23rd, 4004 BC. Um, that works for me. Close enough. Um, back. There we go. Um, I throw this out here, you know, I'm, I'm, the point of me doing this is not to sort of ruffle your feathers or make you upset or anything like that. That's not what I'm trying to do. But if we're going to deal with this Neolithic stuff that goes back before 60, you know, before 4004 BC then we need to sort of acknowledge that maybe there's more to it than this, right? Dendrochronology is one way to look at this. Uh, that's looking at tree rings. Um, also, ice core dating can be determined by volcanic eruptions. Um, seriation, typology, and morphology, these are archaeological methodologies. Uh, seriation is a, how things, uh, sort of how things are arranged into sort of a series. So we look at maybe the layers, uh, typology, technology changes over time, so we make it in a different way, and then the physical aspects of it, morphology, how things change. All these things, radiometric dating, you know, much maligned carbon-14 can only go back, you know, maybe 50,000 years, and then it is very unhelpful. 
Um, but we also have potassium argon dating, lead lead dating, uranium dating, argon argon dating, lumen thermoluminescent dating, even newer types of uh, the sort of radiometric dating that um, I'm not all that familiar with. But when you combine all this stuff and it gives you a date like 15,000 BC or 15,000 CE, probably should go with it. I'm just gonna throw that out there. All right, so. Uh, openings aside, kind of opening information aside, what we're talking about first is hunter-gatherer society prehistory. Before written documents, again, this could go back a really long time, uh, we do have evidence of humans making things and marking things. Of course, uh, you know, we'll skip that for just a second. Just look at some cave painting. Cave painting is one good example of this. Uh, a lot of this is made by taking dyed pigment into a straw, blowing the dye onto a cave wall, uh, other times, hand marks. You can even in place in a place like uh, uh, Chauvet. God bless Chauvet. The French have made a. Uh, the French don't want people going into the actual caves. So they made a giant fake cave next to the the real cave. Um, you can even see people's handprints, like people's. Uh, uh, let me see if I can pull pull that up. Um, you might ask why I don't have these things in my slides, but. Um, eh, I think it's sometimes it's fun to look too. Let's see, fingerprints, Chauvet, will this work? Did I spell it correctly? Uh, oh, there was a guy I follow on Twitter. I'm not even sure if I could bring myself to look into Twitter at this point to try to find what he, the, but he had the, he had some fingerprints that he had, uh, he had some images. Oh, look at that. Cool double-headed axe. All right, this is probably not going to end well, but we're just going to go to Twitter and see if we can find this guy. Oh, cranky weather guy. How oh, I love you. No, 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 not Ice Apocalypse. I want Ice Age, dude. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's usually got some pretty nice stuff. Yeah, early, uh, early settlements. Oh, Ben Franklin. No, if we don't find it in a second. Oh, I like that woolly rhinoceros. Yeah, Chauvet, 30,000 years old. There we go. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Another handprint. Interesting thing about the handprints. Oh, that's creepy. Um, all right, we're not gonna we're not gonna dwell on this because we got other stuff we can be doing. Interesting thing about the handprints that we often see, though. Come on. There we go. A lot of times you see hands that have more than five fingers. Uh, normally in this class, at this point, I would say anybody know what that is. But since I can't ask you questions, I'll just tell you. Polydactylism often comes from inbreeding and populations, um, and so this is maybe something to consider for social changes. You know, are there just no other populations to breed with, uh, or are you saying our populations better than those other yuck it ups? Uh, I think either way is maybe a fair way of looking at it. So, <clears throat> the earliest sort of evidence that we have for anything sort of like humans trying to leave us images anyway. It's not writing, but it's just kind of an artwork. Why do they do these cave paintings? Possibly to ensure successful hunts, possibly for some religious purpose we can't understand. Um, they also give us some insight into what kind of critters were running around at the time. So woolly rhinoceroses in Europe, uh, giant mastodons, oryxes and bison, things we'll see throughout the throughout the class, at least the at least the first parts of the class. There are some different critters that were running around at the time. Um, even some oddballs, so that got something looks like a, some kind of a goat probably lived in Europe. Uh, this thing always reminds me of a critter from Ninja Turtles, the, the warthog dude. Um, let's see. Anything else? I also mentioned too that the time that we're talking about, so the dating here for this paleo, what's called the Paleolithic era, the old Stone Age, could go back a long way. But for these cave paintings, 20, 30, maybe in some cases 40,000 years ago, notice though when we talk about the Ice Age, it, it's called the Ice Age for a reason. And although it's not on this map, a lot of the Northern Hemisphere would have been locked up in glaciers. So a lot of the sea levels are lower. So notice that places that you might not have been able to get to. Uh, like this area, some of the islands here in you know, what is today Malaysia, Indonesia, it was a little different. Humans could maybe travel, and of course the most famous probably is up here at the top, uh, Beringia, which allowed early humans uh, dating is somewhat uh, uh, 
up in the air in terms of uh, debates, but eh, probably around 12 to 15,000 years ago, an ice free corridor existed that allowed people to travel from Eurasia to the Americas. So the world looks a little bit different. And think about this too, if you're an early human, are you going to settle near like inland all the time where it's like cold and wintry? Okay, well maybe there's critters there you are, but maybe you also spend time on the seashore. People kind of like that. Waves are kind of fun, uh, especially maybe if you don't understand that why waves are there. Maybe there's a religious significance to that. It's also a little warmer. Maritime air masses are typically warmer, so maybe there are places that have information about how these people lived we'll never find. Undersea archaeology has done a fairly good job in some of these areas to the north and the North Sea at finding some of these other early settlements, um, but in other areas, not so much. Also something to keep in mind, uh, when these glaciers started to melt, as they eventually will do, sometimes they created giant lakes, uh, specifically in Siberia, as well as in the Columbian River area. And when these lakes created ice dams, I think there was also one in this area too. Um, when those ice dams broke, there were massive floods. And so maybe there's, you know, some people may say, oh, flood stories, you know, blah, blah. Well, maybe there's something to that. Maybe uh, there's some cultural memory that... Big floods are scary. <laughs> okay, let's see. Where are we at? Prehistory, paintings. Also, we have some evidence of... Uh, let's see if I can find the mastodon carvings. Let's see if we can find this. Uh, the mastodon of Lake Michigan. That sounds wonderful. Little, uh, in some cases, little faces. Um, I'm not looking at the dates on these, so I'm probably... So don't... Don't, uh, maybe don't read too much into this. I'm, what I'm trying to find is some of these early uh, Paleolithic ones. I know I've got one of these in my slides, but there we go. My tiger dude. I forgot about him. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, sort of anthropomorphic figure. So, so artwork. A few carvings, some cave paintings. Um, maybe we can find a handprint. Yeah, so we don't have a whole lot. Uh, from this early era. We don't have any writing. So what we have to use uh, are some of the techniques I've mentioned before. Anthropology, look at how people behave. Sociology, so if you have a given number of people in a certain number of group, we know these people couldn't number, the bands couldn't be too big, or you start to have trouble keeping everyone together. So there are sort of some what we might call scientific principles that can allow us to understand some parameters that these people might have operated in. Of course, we also have some of the tools they used. Um, so not just art, some of the art. Um, oh yeah, and the fun devil dog from uh, Lake Superior and the rainbow serpent from Australia. Uh, we'll come back to that maybe. Oh, and, and wouldn't be a lecture on the ancient world without ancient alien man. Okay, probably not. Uh, depictions, if you've ever seen depictions of Kachina, depictions of ancestors, just because we sort of fancy aliens to look like big-eyed um, gray or little green beings doesn't necessarily mean, you know, these are aliens. Um, although, of course, there's also an interest in the heavens. Let me... I'm going to jump ahead a bit to some of the tools, since that's kind of where I was going. And again, you know, one of, the, one of the nice things about this lecture is that once you've listened to it, go back, look through some of these in a different order. We have tools as well, not just stone. In Europe, it's typically flint. In the Americas, it's, it's called chert, uh, although um, people tend to get the two, the two backwards. Um, obsidian as well, volcanic glass. Um, <clears throat> now this uh, this club that was used by the Aztecs is a much later uh, sort of Stone Age technology, but it shows you what you can actually do with stone. Stone doesn't have to be simple. It can be very elaborate, and it can be very, um, very, very deadly. Okay, let's go back to what we were... So we've got some art. We've also got sort of an interest in the heavens that I've mentioned as well. Um, here, uh, here we see in Chaco Canyon... And I'll go ahead and throw a, a quick, uh, quick not a bribe, but a, a shout out to my field trip. I run the Southwest Field Trip. It's a three-week camping trip and hiking trip in the Southwest. If you have some interest in that, I have a couple of spots available. Send me an email. I can give you more information on that. We do go to Chaco Canyon. Um, but here we actually have what looks to be a comet and maybe even a supernova. We know around the 12th century and again around the 11th century there were possibly some supernovas. Uh, this is when a star explodes, and uh, one of these may have been as visible, 
according to astronomers, uh, almost as bright as the moon uh, at some point in time. Maybe not quite that bright, but pretty bright. So bright that if you were looking at the stars and you saw that, you would think, oh God, oh God, it's the end. Or maybe maybe it was the beginning, um, but you would definitely thought something was up. So again, there there is a big interest in the heavens that these people have. Um, also stone carvings. Um, and there are sort of a, a couple of expressions where we start to see maybe there's some sort of religious belief uh, that these people have. A couple of different uh, associations, anyway. One is with uh, a woman. A woman that's typically depicted in one of these little statues are called Venuses. Uh, the oldest one, I think this is one of the oldest ones here, this one's carved out of a mastodon tusk. Um, notice the sort of female, the breasts, hips, uh, belly, sort of a pregnant, uh, healthy pregnant woman. Th we find these little figurines all over the place in Eurasia. Uh, and so, it, you know, it, it seems to have been um, some sort of, well, it's usually sort of looked at as some sort of fertility goddess, earth goddess, fertility cult. This doesn't mean this is like everyone worshiped an earth goddess. That's not what that means. I mean, it's sort of like if you, I mean, think about this today. If you, uh, you know, if a volcano blew up and it covered Knoxville in East Tennessee, okay, probably not going to happen, but if it did, um, and everyone's UT stuff was sort of frozen like in Pompeii, Magically, let's say it was, and archaeologists, does that mean everyone worships Smokey Dog? No, it doesn't. But uh, it means that there was some significance there, right? And I think most people would say there is. Same thing here. Although I do think maybe, you know, something we'll talk about as we go through the classes, the way we look at religion today and the way these people looked at religion, and even later people looked at religion, it's quite a bit different. Um... We we sort of have like separate spheres, uh, although they're not mutually exclusive. We sort of have like political, like sort of like your there's like civic life, like your business, and some people in more, some people less. You know, exclude or include religion in that. But the sort of the way in some ways our society works is, is you, you, people kind of keep the two separate. The separation is sort of this idea of uh, church and state being separate. There's nothing like that in the ancient world. Church and state are the same. What we would think of as, as patriotism today, all the symbols like you know, you know, George Washington's monument, eagles, fireworks, the colors of the American flag, if the ancients came back and saw that, they'd say that is your civic religion. So there's like personal religion, and then there's sort of civic religion in the ancient world. And we're not really, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, because when you, to have a civic religion, you have to have a, what the Romans called a civitas, a city. No cities here. Um, but what I'm trying to sort of get at is uh, religion, maybe, with one's life, was in some ways a lot more public and a lot more in sync, and there was nothing mm, sort of like wearing it on your sleeve about that. It was just how things were. So maybe this is something that's very common. And if you think about it, right, um, well, I'm actually, since I've got Stonehenge here, we'll throw it up. Uh, I don't have... Uh, a picture of one of these. Um, let's go here. Irish. Uh, oh, what are those things called? Now well, we have mounds all over the world, but oh yeah, that one works. New Grange works fine for this. Um, there seems to be this idea of the Earth being associated with rebirth. Uh, perhaps death and rebirth. And if you think about when you're planning things, when you're observing how you grow things, which these people are starting to do, there's beginning to be some domestication of crops. And if you don't sort of understand, like, you don't understand the physics, you don't see the world in a scientific way, when you bury a seed and it sprouts, it could seem kind of magical. So we see these burials of these ancient kings um, kind of look like they're pregnant a little bit. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but maybe not. Um, the, the whole point of this is to sort of give you an idea that there seems to have been some association between the Earth and Earth Mother fertility. That's one half of what we see as sort of a religious, uh, come on, I know, it's hard. Um, and since I'm on Stonehenge, I'll go ahead and just mention, these things, again, are not necessarily 
Earth is not necessarily excluded from the heavens, right? Stonehenge is also a stone circle that may have been built, and some people conjecture it might have even had a dome over it, sort of like that that, uh, that burial mound. Um, it can also be used to see sort of astronomical signs. So maybe all these things are connected for these people. There's not there's not the disparity between the two that we see today. And I throw this in here too. This is a really, really, really weird piece of cave art. Um, first of all, I mention I have this over here just because, well, it's a, it's kind of fun. A bear skull's been encased in this calcium, uh, I think carbonate. That's what makes these, uh, makes these stalactites and stalagmites. I always get the two confused. That being, uh, that being said, what's on this stalactite? And hopefully, I got. The ones it's hanging down. Hopefully, I got that right. It's really unusual. Most of the time in these caves, you occasionally see a humanoid figurine. You see some hands. You see critters. And the idea is, okay, well, we're going to go hunt these critters. Hopefully, we'll be successful if we paint our picture here. Maybe we'll invoke uh, the gods to help us out. This shows some action. And that's probably a really bad way of putting that, based on what I'm about to tell you. But I, what I mean by that is, it's a, something happening. It's not just a static, like, here's a critter. Although, uh, some people have argued that in Chauvet Cave, like these rhinos, it's sort of illustrating a battle between the two. And there's a guy named Werner Herzog, who has a documentary, very interesting, if you are if you got the time, um, about this cave. He speculates that when you applied fire uh, to, or when you had a fire in here, based on the way these walls undulate, it can sometimes look like these critters were moving. So people didn't, you know, when they draw multiple lines, they're not screwing up. They're doing that on purpose, almost like you're making an early cartoon. Well, maybe there's more movement here in this particular slide, um, right? So what we have here is it looks like a person, a human, with a bison's head and here let's go back to our fertility goddesses there we go now just the bottom back hmm it looks similar so maybe there is a relationship here between the sort of male represented by the bull the anthropomorphic bull and the female earth it looks like he's having sex with her so that's when I say I said oh maybe saying there's some action going on here maybe I shouldn't have went there I didn't mean to but what I was meaning by that is that stuff's happening. It's not just a static image. Um, so this bull, the, the female sort of goddess and the male bull goddess, are something we're going to come back to in a lot of these ancient societies. I'll even sort of jump ahead a little bit and say if you've ever you know, read in Greece uh, the Greek mythology story of the Minotaur. Um, Minotaur, half man, half bull, sex, you know, produced by pacify, having sex with a bull. Maybe, maybe, okay, maybe the Greeks are making fun of that story, but maybe there's also some memory of some religion that had something kind of wonky like that going on. Okay, so just to sort of rehash, because um, I know I've, I've kind of done a lot here, and I know I get distracted sometimes. What, what I've tried to do here is sort of start to give you uh, a picture of how these people saw the world, how they interacted with the world, a glimpse at some of the ways they left their mark and showed us what they may have thought about the world. And this is a world without uh, riding and thankfully without uh, some guy who's, if you've ever noticed his hair, it looks like he's slowly being abducted uh, a little bit at a time. A world that's very interested in how you, and how things work. I mean, again, think about it. There, there's no idea that you know they don't have satellites. They can't tell when it's going to rain. They can't. They don't have meteorologists. Although some might say even today, uh, and I'm sort of a weather nerd, so I can say this. You know, it, it can be hard uh, to predict when it's going to rain or snow or whatever it's going to do. How hard, how much harder is it for these people? Um, so any control that you can exercise over that by placating the gods or by you know, making things, or by doing this or that, or just in this case, watching the stars and trying to understand how these things work, it's probably going to be helpful. And think about this too, I mean, these people have thousands of years to do this, before, even before some of the first cities are built. How good are they going to get at this? They're going to get really good, and things being what they are and human nature being what it is, they're going to make it more and more complicated. So astrology for these people is not just you know, reading a horoscope. It's like biochemistry. It's like microbiology. It's very intricate. Most early mathematics were developed 
Uh, well, I shouldn't say most, because there'll be someone who's it's like, no, that's not what math is for. Okay, I get that. But a lot of early mathematics were developed to understand how stars moved and where stars were going to be. Um, also for architecture and things like that. So yeah, uh, Stonehenge, of course, there's a bigger hinge called Durrington Wells. Uh, rivers were actually seen as kind of interesting things too, right? Because they're sort of, they're, 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 they're in between things. Because, again, these people kind of like to comp compartmentalize uh, we think anyway, the heavens, the earth, the waters, uh, rivers come from streams, which come from springs in the hills. Well, that's really weird. Okay, for us, we understand, you know, groundwater wells up into a mountain, and it falls down uh, the mountainside into streams, which flow into rivers, which flow into lakes or oceans. Um, but for these people, water, I mean, of course, water is important, too, for, for living. Why does it come out of the earth? Um, and if you look in the heavens, a lot of times you'll see something that looks a lot like a river. Let me pull it up here. No, not Milky. I'm sure if I typed in Milky May, that would get something just wonderful to pop up. There we go. Okay, that's the whole galaxy. But when you look in the sky, you're like, I mean, what is that? Like, hey, come on the field trip with me. You might get to see this in person. It's hard to see here with the light pollution, but... Maybe it's a river. It kind of wobbles a little bit. Seems to be that's what a lot of people thought. It was a path. It was a road. It was a river. In the ancient world, rivers are highways. So water, the heavens, the earth, all these things are going to be really important. Uh, we've looked at some of the artifacts. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I mean, early, artifact, early artifacts, it's a big stone that someone has beat down to a point. I mean, okay, well, maybe in some ways this is Jack Black with Michael Sarah. Oh, me kill with big rock. Oh. Some of it's more sophisticated, though. Needles, fish hooks, those sorts of things made out of bones. Scrapers are really important. Uh, it looks like I forgot to fix that, so... I apologize for that. If you're just the benefit of looking at the uh, the videos here is that you can actually see see this, um, right? These hunter gatherer, and this is who we've been talking about for the most part so far. Hunter gatherer societies. A lot of things we find are scrapers. They kind of function like little pocket knives. And notice the shape, even like the shape of a knife blade, fairly similar. Uh, we talked about that. Okay, uh, something else to talk about: language families. Um, we sort of try to figure out where people came from, or one of the ways you can figure out how people have moved over time is by studying their languages. This doesn't always work. And the reason it doesn't always work is because you have language family isolates, which don't seem to match anyone else. This is especially true in North America with Native American languages, uh, but also languages like uh, Basque. Not entirely sure where that came from. Um, but different sorts of languages. So for Southern India, Dravidian, actually, let's just go to Maya. Go to my map here. Um, we, yeah, we have Sino-Tibetan, Afro-Asiatic, Austro-Asiatic, Austronesian, Altaic, uh, Indo-European, Niger, Congo, Dravidian in India. Uh, so Indo-European is going to be most of the people from Ireland to India. Uh, and I'll go back and look at that one in just a second. I know more about that when I'm more familiar with those language families, so I can talk a little more specifically about that. But... Uh, Austrasian, uh, uh, some of these have some different names from when I originally made this slide down. Nilo, Afro, uh, no, I think Nilo Asiatic usually, is usually what this is called now. Um, there are about four major language families in Africa. Um, Indo-European, of course, is for most of Europe. Um, I can't even, this, you know, how many there are in the Americas. Uh, not that they take up a large portion of what people speak now, Indo-European because of English, does. Um, but there's such a variety in the Americas. Austronesian, um, sort of out in the areas of Oceania, so the Pacific, uh, of course, Sino-Tibetan, uh, Chinese. Um, but yeah, and so we can use these uh, to try to figure out about migrations in the ancient past, because if people speak the same language, either a people moved, or they conquered and made people speak a different language. But even you can distinguish between those two because if someone was conquered, typically they have some other old words. And typically because conquest is not always uh, we win, you lose, you do everything we say. It's more of a negotiation, right? Um, it may sound fun to say you, but then you, once you've conquered someone, you have to get them to do what you want to do. And you have to communicate with them. So there's a, it's a two-way street. 
Um, so we can use these languages to do that. I use Indo-European here, Raja, the Indian word for king, Rex, Latin for king, Re, Irish for king, uh, Tu, Thu, and Te. These are all words for you. Uh, oh, if you ever wondered why, like, uh, Shakespearean English or the King James Bible has the word thou, uh, we'll just dump it out here. It's actually this word, um, but just spelled without the thorn, the Anglo-Saxon symbol there. Yeah. So, okay. And Indo-Europeans, in terms of, uh, sort of, they, they've been, the, the language family anyway, I don't want to say they've been successful because that's kind of a very general statement and there are so many different varieties of people within that group, but that language family has been very successful. Um, it's what you're listening to right now uh, in, in English. Uh, they're also very successful in terms of um, moving around. We actually have some mummies from the Tarim Basin, the Tarim, Tarim, Tarim Basin. Um, I think I'm kind of liking doing these lectures online because in class it's hard to walk to a computer and do this, but now I can just do it right here. Um, let's go to Google Maps. Uh, that's not the way I want to go. Someone's like, that's where you live. And yeah, it is. Come, I guess you're going to come find me now. Um, Tarim Basin. There we go. Urumqi. Let's go to a satellite. So, very green, but also very deserty close by. And so this area is so dry. Uh, Gobi, I think, is, is, I mean, it's a desert. It's one of the major deserts in the world. I'm not sure where it ranks in terms of dryness. I know the... Um, oh, the Atacama in South America is the driest. Um, but uh, this is so dry that some people just sort of randomly buried there or mummified. And we found these people that have lots of tattoos. Oh, sad babies. Um, but also really unusual clothing. They sort of have tartans on made out of blue jean material, but worn like kimonos. And even some of the facial hair is, is, has remained. These people seem to have actually been members of this Indo-European uh, group. Uh, and they have exciting things, you know, like mustaches and tartan robes made of cotton, sort of denim, or a, a version of denim. And they also had uh, <laughs> hallucinogenic uh, evidence of hallucinogenic mushrooms in their pockets. So take that for what you... And you know, I mean, in the ancient world, and this is, someone's going to read this as me saying, oh, we said we should all go out and, you know... Have some mushroom. I'm not saying that's not what I'm saying, but drugs are used in some ways very differently in the ancient world. There's no, you know, sort of like someone coming out and saying you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. And again, I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying. Um, uh, let's see if I can find this. Persian. Silos. I'm spelling that wrong, but whatever. Maybe that's it. Do I have my... There's a very specific robe that's recently been discovered that shows a Persian ruler consuming sort of a... Uh, a, a what as some people allege is a hallucinogenic mushroom. But I believe these mummies also had cannabis in their pockets too. So maybe they were living it up, maybe they weren't. Um, that is one area where I'm willing to say I wasn't there. I don't know. All right. Uh, so, is there something, there's not a, making sure there's not a, what in the world? This is what I get for changing these, uh, the colors on this slide stuff, like, randomly to make them fit better on, online. So what we're going to talk about now, we've, we've kind of done a little overview of, of the ancient world, uh, to an extent. We've talked about art, language, hunter, get, we're going to look at how do we go from these sort of bands of people living together to what comes to be known as the Neolithic. So what we were talking about before is the Paleolithic, the Old Stone Age. Now we're going to talk about the new one, the Neolithic. Uh, and some of the first evidence we have for that comes from a place called Ayn Khazal. Uh, this is in sort of what is called the Fertile Crescent. Uh, it runs from uh, sort of just north of Egypt and Gaza through is modern Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, uh, down and kind of curves down following the Tigris and Euphrates valleys down through Iraq and to the Persian Gulf and in Kuwait. Um, now, uh, some of the first evidence of cities comes from that area, but we also see around the same time, we also see cities developing in other parts of the globe. Um, Yellow River Valley in China, uh, Karal 
in uh, in the Americas, and I've, uh, in the other sli different slides, I'll talk about these. But for this one, we're just going to stick with sort of the the Fertile Crescent and some of these. Again, two heads. What's going on there? Maybe there's some uh, uh, interbreeding <laughs> happening. Maybe there's some indication from a place like Jericho or Ryan Gazal. If you have a city like Jericho, and of course Jericho is most famous in the Bible for the walls, which, as the song says, came a tumbling down. Um, maybe there's a reason they have walls. Maybe they don't like the other people. Maybe they want to keep them out. Maybe they don't want to have sex with them. As part of all that. So, um, maybe there's evidence here for some social stratification. All right, moving on. So here's the Fertile Crescent. I'm pretty sure there's a quiz question that's got a picture of all this, and it's colored in green, and it says, "What is which of the following best describes this area here? And the answer is the Fertile Crescent. Why is this called the Fertile Crescent? Well, number one, uh, let's get the pen back. Come on, pen. There we go. It sort of looks like a big... Okay, that shouldn't be there, but it looks like a crescent. It's called the Fertile Crescent, because it's in this area, and notice here especially, Sato Huyuk will talk about this area in detail, and Gobekli Tepe will talk about that area in just a minute too. It's in this area that we have some of the first evidence of widespread domestication of things like barley, wheat, rye, grasses. These are all grasses, and so it's the domestication of grasses uh, and other plants that's going to allow for humans to build up surpluses. Surpluses have to be farmed, they have to be stored, then they have to be used. This is going to start to allow for different types of societies to be created. Again, same thing will happen in China with rice, uh, with amaranth uh, in South America. Uh, and some, so I, I have a reasonable question. Someone, why does this happen around the same time? Well, think about the climate. Uh, I haven't said a whole lot about the climate since the very beginning. But remember, this is, this is the Ice Age. It's ending. Things are warming up. And so in certain areas, humans sort of developing at a similar rate, maybe these areas became fertile and maybe um, humans were sort of there at the right time to see this. And we'll look in a little more detail at how, how all this happens, at least uh, in this this particular area. So all these little areas here are sites where we have some evidence. Oh, Hollow 2, I think I have a little bit about. Teleswad, uh, another, another particular area. Um, these are areas where we have sort of the archaeological evidence of grain being domesticated. Um, we also can have done down in gen genetic studies where we've looked at all the grains that we use today, at least the cereal type of grains. Like uh, when I say the cereal, I mean the word cereus is just the Greek word for grain. But um, what I mean here are things like wheat, barley, and rye. And they come from here. They come from sort of what is today Syria, southwest Turkey. Um, from a specific hill, actually, they've uh, they've actually narrowed it down to a specific hill, and so it seems to have been in this area. Maybe this was just really climatically really nice at the time. Uh, there were humans there. We know that you know people have been eating grain for a long time. We've seen some evidence in China as early as twenty seventeen to twenty thousand years ago of domestication of rice. Same thing in Europe with oats. Uh, people seem to have kind of had the idea uh, during the last ice age that they can get some grasses and they can get the grains off the grass. They can mash them up and boil them and make like an oatmeal gruel or something like that. But it's something happens around 10 to 8,000 BC and all that sort of starts to get channeled, not just into sort of occasional mills at areas where the grasses grow, but into more civilized life. And we'll look at how some of that may have happened as we go through here. Oh, there's Gobekli Tepe. Interesting. Uh, one of the earliest... Uh, oh, there's my... Oh, and there's creepy... creepy hippo demon. Um, of course, fox man, or fox there. One of the earliest um, sites of human... Uh, such for human construction. Um, notice the round shape again. Notice the entrance, uh, and there, notice that there are different levels of uh, of occupation in this. So maybe there is already some sort of religious hierarchy. And so, and what we'll see with this, what what a guy and you know, hundred years or so called the Neolithic Revolution. Not uh, not that there wasn't a revolution, but people often don't like to see it this way now. Uh, they see it as revolution implies every every all of a sudden people are like, oh shit, we've been living like idiots. Let's all sit down and 
Civilized. Well, maybe it was a little more slower than a revolution. But maybe, as we'll see, religion does have a big role to play in this. Maybe we've already got some social stratification. When I say social stratification, what I'm talking about here is having different types of people with different ranks. Probably had some of that before, but we're going to see a lot more of it as time goes on. When you're living in a small band, maybe 13 people, <coughs> kind of know each other's business. It's hard. You, you can have, you know, maybe a top dog, to use that sort of an analogy, but you can have a whole lot of social variation. You kind of know what everybody's doing. When you start to have big old groups of people organized for big old labor projects, you got to feed them, you got to convince them this is an awesome idea. Because, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, just all things being equal, you know, unless someone really does some convincing, I'm not going to put down everything I'm doing to survive and go build a big bunch of stone circles and erect some monoliths. Um, but if you can convince me that this might make the gods happy and might make things better for me, then, oh, heck yeah, I'm all for it. Let's build some monoliths. So that's what we see here. We start to see some labor being organized, and so maybe there's some evidence here, some connection between these early cultivations of grain and Gobekli Tepe. I'm going to be 100% honest. I'm not super knowledgeable on this particular site. I throw it out there because it is one of the earliest ones, and I want you to be familiar with it. But um, without writing, there's still a whole lot that we don't know. This is what's left of it today. Um, there's my fox critter. Maybe an alligator. Some people speculate this is a lion, and I think a lion might be kind of important because the lions will come to be associated with the female goddess that we've mentioned before uh, in Egypt, uh, especially, but also in the, the next city we'll look at, Saddle Huyuk. Um, doesn't look a lot like a lion, but <clears throat> if you keep in mind there are different critters running around 12,000 years ago, there were these short faced lions, kind of like the short faced bears, maybe this weird looking snouted lion. Maybe that's what this is supposed to be. And this is just a random goofy gnome head. It has nothing to do with Gobekli Tepe, but what the heck I'm teaching, I can show you goofy gnome heads. Okay, so what happens? Actual notes. <coughs> Excuse me. So at the end of the last glacial phase, things start to warm. When you know it, about the time things start to warm, we start to see people making pottery. We start to see people making different types of microlith. The word lith here means stone. So different types of stone tools. Maybe they're just starting to figure this out, though. And, of course, when you have pottery, what in the world do you need pottery for? Storing stuff. Carrying stuff around. So maybe we're seeing some of the first steps. So what we maybe start to see is that there are certain areas that have better crop, better grains or better food. We have certain areas that have better critters, like watering holes. Maybe near those watering holes, there's also, of course, plants need water, too. Maybe there's a field of grain. And maybe if you're a hunter-gatherer and, you know, it's been cold and you get a warm summer or a warm year or two, you're like, hey, it's sitting around here waiting for stuff to come to me. It ain't half bad. Maybe you start to hang out there for a while. So what we're maybe starting to see is some of the first evidence of people starting to get the idea. Maybe we wait for stuff to come to us here. That doesn't mean they don't go out and hunt some, too. Of course you do. If you're hungry and there's nothing there, you're going to go do it. But maybe the idea is starting to catch on a little bit. Um, one, of the, an ev and one of these sites, it's a really, really early site uh, that has some evidence for this, is Ohalo 2. This is not the best quality video. Hopefully the link still works. Uh, I'm not going to click on it right now, but... I don't want to waste any time on that particular video, but it's a, it's the guy who excavated the site explaining it. You may not even have to watch it. I usually just do this for a little bit when I have, teach the class live. Um, but the the site's important because there was a big flood. Um, this, sh this should say, oh no, go back, bad. Go back. This should say burnt uh, because of weird accident of factor of various factors. This camp was burnt, and then uh, the Sea of Galilee rose really quickly for some reason, probably melting water from somewhere or maybe there's just a big flood because of a climatic change uh, but the burning and then the covering of the mud preserved this in sort of an anaerobic environment so a lot of stuff was preserved and so we're able to see that these people as early as 21,000 BC had already figured out that things like wheat different types of grain could be preserved we also see these people were kind of kind of rugged uh, there was a guy here that had recently died uh, that had just been buried again fortuitously for archaeologists had an arrowhead stuck in his back, and it had, it had been in there so long it had healed. So, bad times for him. Okay, so, 
two things that go into the, to go into domestication, or two types of domestication here, uh, of food and also of critters. How does this work for food? Okay, well, some wild grasses, some are tougher, some ripen later. Uh, one, the type that ripen later are probably going to be more likely to be picked because you can transport those um, to other areas. And so what you're going to see here is sort of humans intervening in natural selection. Um, humans are going to take some of the wild grasses that they're using with the, the seeds, the ones that are tougher, uh, they're going to pick those because, again, you can transport them, uh, use them, you know, when you, when you try to go pick one, it's not going to fall apart. I mean, think about it too, if you're, if you're picking a bear, if you ever want to pick wild berries, you want something, you don't want one that's too ripe, that's like, looks like it's about to rot, you don't want one that's not ripe enough, um, you want something that's just right. It's kind of the Goldilocks effect. So yeah, um, so over time, what's going to happen is humans are going to take these back, they're going to carry them, let's say you carry it over a distance of several miles, and once you pick it, it starts to die. Um, certain bits of the grain are going to spill out uh, next to wherever you're doing preparation or cooking. Um, and, uh, sorry, my dog started to randomly bark. Um, certain... Uh, Certain, sorry. Can you make the dog be quiet, please? Sorry about that. Sorry about that. The dog is just, uh, actually, just give me a second. Okay, I'm sorry. Just going to have to deal with it barking. Wife's in the shower, so... Okay. Certain grains, they go back. You take the, the tougher grain, uh, is going to make it back. Some of them are going to fall there, and then the person's going to see next year, oh, wait, hey, I don't have to walk as far. And so certain types of grains are going to be cultivated over others, and people are going to eventually learn, um, well, shoot, if you just drop some of these down... <laughs> Because, hey, we had them piled up over there for whatever reason last time. Maybe we could just, maybe, maybe they'll grow here. And so people learn over time. And again, this is not an all, it's not something that happens all at once over, you know, hundreds and maybe even thousands of years. Um, this begins to be a way uh, of living, a way that's better, maybe easier in some ways than having to go out and look for stuff all the time. This is probably something that's also sort of a supplement to hunting as well. Because you, you, know, you can't just live, I guess you could live on, you could try to live on grains alone. Um, but you also have to go out and get wild, other, even if you're not eating meat, you got to get you know, wild, other wild plants, berries, and things like that. So over time, what we start to see is people decide that uh, for whatever reason, we're still not entirely sure uh, what makes people make the jump? Why give up one lifestyle over the other? It seems sensible to us, right? You know, instead of having to go out and hunt and gather every day uh, to be able to just go to places and get allotments of food, the grocery stores are in this case the the common granary. Um, we're not sure what people make. You know, it makes sense to us, but to these people, maybe it's a bit jarring and a bit difficult to give up one amount of sort of freedom uh, for another another sort of a thing. Um, so Sorry, the dog has just lost it. I thought my wife was going to watch it, but apparently I'm just SOL and on my own. All right, I'm going to one more time. Okay, dog has been hopefully taken care of. Same thing with critters. The first things that seemed to be domesticated were goats, sheep, finally cattle, probably because they're the biggest. It seems as though what happened was that we first domesticated the small sort of timid ones, probably a good idea. And then over time, 
we sort of bred for the traits we liked. I should also say dogs are probably domesticated before goats, but <clears throat> in this case, what I'm talking about are sort of the, I guess, the herd animals. Uh, the, uh, you know, fur, meat, milk, eventually cheese, those kinds of things. And of course, with grain and with, uh, with uh, we see this in, in Eurasia with milk and cheese too, if you let it set out for a while, sometimes it tends to ferment. And so it seems that rather early on, people also learned that they could get drunk too. Um, the culture that we give this sort of transitional phase between uh, these sort of the early Neolithic to the first cities is called Natufian culture. Uh, and in this sort of culture, what we start to see is what, uh, again, this, uh, this guy who talked about the uh, revolution, uh, the Neolithic revolution, I believe Gordon Child was his name, uh, is this revolution in symbols. So we start to see depictions of a fertility goddess, a bull we talked about, hunting uh, certain critters, uh, and then this process of neolithicization. Okay, that's I'm not ever going to make you use that word again. So let's just move on to look at the symbols. So we, you know, if you're a hunter gatherer, there's not really any reason to have a giant bull seed unless you just kind of like it. But in Saddlehuyuk, where these are found, there are lots of them. Um, so maybe there's a symbolic uh, there's a symbolic message here. Uh, the critters that these people had. I keep referencing them, but I'm not showing you. Um, Aurochs, 5e, I don't even know what that is, means. Look how much larger, maybe this is, I want a big image, doggone it. Okay, well, that's not very helpful, but they're really big. That's the point I'm trying to get at. They're really big. So maybe there is a symbolism of power here, male power, the big powerful bull. Um, it's still, I mean, it's in some ways it's still, uh, you know, you know, doing stuff for festivals and things with bulls is still common. Still have running of the bulls in uh, Spain. You still have rodeos. I mean, the bull rider. That's the not been to a rodeo. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the the bull rider is the. Although I, if you count my friend who wanted to get on top of a bull and have a shock it with a prod and see what happened, maybe that counts. I don't know as a rodeo, um, but. The bull riding, that's it's still something that goes on. You also see these symbols here that look very much like those for, like little versions of the fertility goddesses. All right, we've got to get back to the... There we go. So saddle huyuk, uh, sometimes it says a, a C, it's called a tail on it, it's called a caudate, caudate C. Um, and this is... All right, so this particular area that we've... First, we looked at some of these images from. It's called Saddlehuyuk, and I showed you where that was just a few minutes ago uh, when we were looking at that map. Um, let's see. Yeah, back to the big slide. That's what I want. So, around 6,000, Saddlehuyuk, or 7th millennium, so 6,000 BC. Saddlehuyuk um, is sort of an odd, uh, sort of an odd thing because it's it's not going to be like the big cities that we see later. It seems to be sort of like, sort of grown out of a, a very particular trait, and that is the trade in obsidian. It n is near a, sort of a volcanic plain, and it seems as though these people were able to first start to create a city by trading obsidian in exchange for products that they they couldn't make themselves or couldn't make enough of themselves. Um, so maybe not like some of the cities we see we're going to see later on, but. <coughs> It gave them the free time, and when you have the extra free time, uh, or when time's freed up to do do different things other than surviving, you gotta take up that time with something. Uh, so maybe that's why we see some more of the symbolism here. We've got time. These people maybe even had this place may have even not just been a commercial center, but also a religious center uh, as well. And there we go. When you know it, big old bull fresco, bull wall at Saddle Huyuk, and also uh, more more bulls and people running from bulls and horses. Um, this is thought to be a map, uh, a map of the city. Uh, to me, it looks like two Doritos. That's probably insensitive and unfair, but uh, the idea is that these are sort of the houses and maybe this is like a, a pen for critters outside the town. Maybe there's some domesticated bulls there, domesticated cattle. Notice here too, there are no roads. Um, this is, you know, people, You got, there's a premium on space, your door Come on, mouse. Your door is at the top of your house, and people would walk across the roof. It's kind of like Aladdin, if you're old Disney movie sort of stuff, if you think about that. And this is the goddess that we found. 
female fertility goddess. We've seen this before, although this is a much different manifestation. It's actually sort of a, a person now instead of like a headless female body. Quick kitties too, little kitty cats. Keep this in mind for when we get to Egypt. Uh, lions will be associated with um, the female goddess Isis. So maybe there's some connection uh, to that as well. Okay, so what happens over time? Um, this sort of a lifestyle, the urban lifestyle again, not entirely sure why people turn their... It may have just been that this offered more of an explanation uh, and maybe in some ways more ease than they had had before. But also you think about this too, once you start to have organization, you start to have social hierarchy, I think you also start to be able to have things like organized armies, organized religion, uh, and that will in some ways make your armies more effective. So maybe... It's not just about the carrot. It's also about the stick. So in other words, you're not just giving people a better life, but you're also saying you got to do it. Um, and I think we see that. You eventually see laws. You see armies. You see tyrants and kings. Those kinds of things. Um, why does all this start to happen? I think it's a, a conglomeration of factors. And of course, you also have to temper this by what is, you know, what is civilization. Uh, we tend to think of civilization as uh, sort of, uh, you know, the best of the best. You know, they're civilized, uncivilized. Um, to us, most of these people would probably seem to be very uncivilized. So we're going to keep kind of a loose definition here. Not that, not that I necessarily think we're any more or less civilized. I think we're all still sort of humans, um, but. Um, it's going to be a different lifestyle than some of the people who are still hunter-gatherers. And we'll see in some of the societies that we look at, when we go to places like China, we go to Mesopotamia, there's still kind of a fear of the people that have decided, eh, that life might not be for me. I mean, maybe disasters force some of this, maybe the warming climate helped with this. I think, But I think all this probably sort of happened at you know over time together. Maybe uh, by whatever chance of fortune uh, the people of a certain city with a certain set of gods were successful well maybe if your gods get beat maybe you decide to change your gods maybe that's how that changes of course we know the ice age is ending so climate's probably going to be and we'll see this in egypt especially people move around depending on how the sahara whether the sahara is dry or not Believe it or not, um, around 8,000 years ago, between 8 and 5,000 years ago, or let's put it this way, between 8,000 and 5,000 um, B.C., the Sahara gets wet. Um, so climate can have a lot to do with where people live. And, of course, all this has to be mitigated by the fact that time marches on. Um, Maybe it's just a gradual process. Um, copper, I don't know too much about this being the Copper Age. I throw this image in here just to give you some sort of an idea. Of, hey, look, I mean, this is, uh, this is what we're starting to move to um, by the time, you know, before we get to the Bronze Age. We have walls. Probably implies we think of ourselves as better than those people over there so there's sort of a corporate identity here we have different groups of houses maybe there are even sub corporate identities you have the people who do like what we might think of as metalworking people who we might think of as uh, um, you know woodworking people that work out in the fields of course you have military folk that guard the town administered by kings and of course the the big question that we're going to start to see and it's in some ways still with us today who's in charge right because we have different layers of walls right okay in, in one way it's practical let's all go back in here if someone attacks because that's a hell of a lot less of an area to defend than this big old wall over here but maybe people people aren't attacking all the time right so maybe there's some social stratification here maybe we have sort of the okay well you're just a shoemaker you live at the bottom or you're just a, a field worker you live out here somewhere oh wait you do uh you know metal working maybe you're a little bit higher up or maybe you're a military leader maybe you're a king maybe you're a religious leader and that's the question we start to see which comes first or which is more important the religious leader or the king uh the political leader or the religious leader if you're the peasant think about it i mean the king's the one that that has executive authority he is going to be the person or the maybe king's too strong of a word here maybe a chief um he tells the nobles the important folk what to do. He tells the army what to do, and the army can, that's, that's force, it can coerce you and make you do stuff if you don't want to do it. But uh, who reads the signs? 
who tells you if the rains are going to come or not? Who tells you if the gods are happy? Who do you go to if you're sick, right? This is another way that, you know, medicine's very, very different. This is a very different sort of a world than what we have. Most of your religious folk are also going to be sort of healers because demons can cause people to be infected. Uh, the word flu itself comes from the word influenza, which is the sort of an Italian word for influence, the way the stars, stars were thought to be able to cast light in certain ways and cause plagues to break out. So the religious folk have a lot to do with your well-being as well. And so we not only start to see to sort of, let me, let me simplify this, social stratification in some of these early cities, but then that begs the question of which dog is on top which person is the true ruler and this is a question that we'll sort of explore as we go on through time uh, some different variations of some neolithic stuff i'm not going to worry too much about that today and of course um, as time goes on people finally figure out um, and i think maybe this sort of worked like this uh, of course meteorites are if you see one of those and you've already figured out how to smelt stuff maybe that's an important thing because it's a rock from the heavens whoa that's it's kind of weird. How did that? How did that happen? But of course, just deposits of gold and silver. It's it's shiny, right? What if you had a shiny rock and you left it by the fire and it got really hot one day and it started to melt? Well, maybe I can, and it and then it sort of hardens into the shape that it melted in. Well, what if I make something out of uh, clay and let it go into that and then I let that break? Then I have that particular shape, and so. Metallurgy, gold, silver, rare metals, metals that are hard to work with, eventually copper and tin, uh, sort of more base metals you can find ore of, uh, create bronze, people figure out you can mix things to make alloys, and of course finally um, iron, uh, probably the most, the toughest of all these sort of metal technologies for the ancient world. And there's some examples of what you can make with copper and those kinds of things. Finally, the, the metallurgy, I'll sort of end this section. This is King Tut's dagger, King Tutankhamun. He had a meteoritic da dagger, and it, you know, through chemical testing, we've discovered this actually was made from iron from a meteorite. All right, so that's it. I think that gets through all these slides. Uh, I've complained about my dog enough, so I might as well show you uh, a picture of my dog, if I can find it. Um, this is probably also not going to end well, but we're going to try to do it anyway okay let's go to me away from all you people oh there's my dog but oh i have some sarcastic things so we probably don't want to pay attention to that um photos there we go there we go we'll just go to the yeah, that's a weird photo let's go to this there he is i think he's younger here my wonderful wife jessica and dude bro dog of love all right uh that's it um Please email me if you have any questions.